Okay, let's get started. So, put you on gallery mode so I can see all of you. There you are. Mick and I wanted to call you all together here because most of you are about to embark on your adventure to go to the camp and collect data there. And if you're not, then you are planning to do so um, in the future. And we've had various conversations with you. So you're kind of all in different stages right now with where, you, um, where you're at with the journey. But we thought it would be valuable to run through the process of a camp saying we want to collect data all the way to the data being collected and being shared with the network um, step by step and different parts will be relevant to different people but we thought it would be great to run through it systematically so that uh, we have it recorded and can use it as well for future reference. Um, we're also going to run through the different tests and answer any questions that you have so that everyone's clear. Um, we have created, well, we're in the process of creating videos of Mick at Camp Mama Adama in Portugal doing the tests, but they're still being edited right now. So we hope to have those with you ASAP, but here is a chance today for us to go through the tests and answer any questions anyone has about, about them. And then lastly, we're gonna discuss how to uh, create an, a place online where all of you can regularly chat together, interact, so that when you're doing data collection at the various camps and you have a question or you just want to, you know, show a little picture or a video, we want to create a little data collection community so that you can all feel connected and share tips and tricks. Um, so yeah, that's essentially our agenda. Um, so to begin, Mick has created this framework of how many tests are there, Mick? I'm testing you now. It's it's growing, but it's uh, at thirteen we are now. Yeah. Some are um, testing the same indicators. Yeah, they have been. Maybe Mick, you want to talk a bit about the development process, how you how you came to create them? Sure. Yeah. Um, yes, I don't. I don't really know. Was everyone who is here in principle in the seminar last week as well? Just so I know. No, not too... everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, most most of the tests I um, yeah I, I built on actually they were already uh, in the original version of the framework and were a bit tweaked and improved uh, from the experiences that uh, two people had last year. Um, I will share maybe just my screen so you so you know what I'm talking about. Um, can you see a table of contents? Mm -hmm. So here we we can see there's quite a lot of uh, indicators and they are relevant to different uh, camps in in different ways and I mean, uh, many, many are already used in different frameworks. So we considered um, Alan Savory's framework. We considered also a framework developed by a permaculture research institute. So there's obviously a lot of great stuff already out there and really uh, ready to use. Um, and we've been integrating this in the context of ecosystem restoration. And um, Roland and Fran are here today as well. They've, they've uh, really helped to focus on biodiversity metrics. Of course, this is a very challenging uh, indicator because every ecosystem is so unique and um, there's various ways of surveying biodiversity and this, including it in a common framework is challenging uh, inherently. Um, but, but maybe we can dive into, their, into the biodiversity indicator as well, because this was a question also last week and we think it's, it's really interesting and cool and, and we want to uh, yeah, have it incorporated at the camps. Um, yeah, so 
I don't know if, if everyone had a chance to go through the different tests and maybe already select together with the camp managers um, which tests or which indicators you want to be monitoring. But what, what we've done in the framework um, for this year is really, fra we, we started framing these indicators as a toolkit that camps really can use to um, monitor progress of their work of the restoration efforts and they they can do so by selecting contexts relevant or the indicators that are relevant to their ecosystems and at the same time we also obviously want or would like to see a global picture of what is happening so there's a few uh, a few indicators and this will be become more clear when you receive the new version of the framework there's a few indicators that we would like to measure everywhere biodiversity is one of them um, but also <clears throat> carbon sequestration and uh, we have soil compaction, which we Did you see already the, all this? often deal with um, desertifying ecosystems and compacted soils. It's, it's something we would like to look at everywhere. And otherwise, um, our recommendation is that camps decide on a set of indicators for five years and then um, engage in monitoring and collect data collection for those five years using those indicators. So there, there's both the set that we want to measure everywhere and also the set that each camp will decide. Something uh, we're not gonna do last year. Measures, based on our resources, uh, financial resources, but also manpower. And this is also, um, things that are, I mean, that make sense to measure here in our ecosystems. Earthworms are not present everywhere. Um, so maybe there's different, there's different indicators that are more relevant in, in some locations than in others. And from this perspective of, or I would say from a remote perspective in terms of uh, interacting with camps, it's quite difficult at this stage to say, these are, um, these are the indicators that are relevant for your sites. So we really engage in dialogue with uh, people who are going to collect data and the camp managers to to discuss what yeah what what can be camp relevant indicators. Um, let me just here maybe it's relevant to pick up on this chart that I also showed uh, last week. But it ties in with um, with this idea of the context specific stuff. And when we when we start from a, a vision, uh, and the camp has defined what are the degraded ecosystems they are hoping to change, and then they can establish certain restoration goals and objectives. Um, the Society for Ecological Restoration, in in their framework, they work towards a reference ecosystem after establishing a baseline study. Here, maybe in more simple terms, we, we just would like to see um, illustrated what are the things or even your own guesses of how you can affect change in those ecosystems. And so what are the things you're trying to change? Is it um, you're trying to bring more water infiltration in the soil, then you're going to, to try to plant some perennials in some pieces of land and in other pieces of land, just uh, apply mulch. Whatever that is, you you can you you start identifying. Oh yeah, these are the things that I want to do, and these are the things that could help me measure uh, measure progress of my work and and check whether I'm on the right path to achieve these uh, restoration goals. But we realize as well, uh, and this is why why I felt this chart needed to be created, that not every camp really necessarily starts here. And uh, many camps will have started doing stuff, uh, planting trees, and maybe now already at the stage of making sense of what's happening. And even so, um, my recommendation would be, of course, engage in monitoring and look critically at, at what's being done and whether it's uh, effective and, and working or not. And so from there, that can also be still integrated in a site map. Uh, what is happening where? What are the kind of expected outcomes that you're trying to achieve? 
and what's what are the metrics that will help you uh, assess whether you're you're working towards these outcomes yeah so just to summarize that basically the the framework with the tests have been created in a sort of menu format so that there are some ones that are that we probably will call common indicators that all of the camps should measure against because those are the things that when put together we will be able to present to the world and say the camps movement is increasing biodiversity the camps movement is you know there are like a few key uh, indicators that we would like to present as um, for the movement as a whole and then there are others that are for you to choose from depending on your vision for the land your biome your context etc uh, and the indicators that are kind of added extra ones we will continue to develop so that by the end of it what we're hoping is that every camp will have its own framework that is relevant to to that camp specifically so once that process has been done then you as a camp manager you would tell us okay we have the capacity as a team to do this data collection ourselves, or we would like some support from a data collector. Uh, and, and once we know that we can go out, find someone who wants to become a data collector, give them training. They then travel to the camp, stay there, do the data collection. Um, sorry, I've missed a step. Find the data collector, then decide which tests you want to do and create a budget based on how much the tests will cost. Uh, and all of those documents, like the, the budget template, et cetera, we, we can send you if we haven't done that already. And then this is a, an opportunity for the ERC Foundation and the camps to collaborate on financing those, those materials that will then become the property of the camp for for the rest of time. Um, and we have decided that we will buy, as, as the ERC Foundation, we will buy the penetrometers and the data loggers, which measure soil compaction and surface temperatures. And the reason for buying those two is that we want to try and get a discount from the manufacturers, buying them in bulk so that we can send them out. And also, the data will be a lot more valuable and interesting if the same equipment is used because it makes it comparable across all of the different sites. And those two things are the most expensive and they come to around 500 euros. Uh, so that's essentially the process. Does anyone have any questions on that? I know a lot of you already know this, um, so sorry if, if I'm repeating myself, but I want this recording to be useful to future camps and data collectors too. Um, I know that some of the Camp Patchelan and Camp Bisley uh, have already gone through this process. And if you haven't yet gone through this process, Fran and Roland, Nancy and Frank, um, we can talk about that in the coming weeks. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any questions about the process before we move on to the tests themselves? Or even um, maybe it's also interesting to hear say from Daryl um, how, how this ties in with your experience so far. Um, you've made a budget now did you was did you manage to select first the indicators that are relevant for monitoring or you assumed you wanted to do everything um, for your baseline study how how is that unfolding i think it's a well of course you know we're committed to supporting the the movement so we want to obviously do the tests that are being recommended for all the camps. I mean, for starters, I think um, for us, it, it's really uh, relevant, the soil compaction, which is a big issue. We really think they'll be extremely valuable to monitor that and water retention. Those are the two biggest um, opportunities I think we have to uh, 
kind of make make things make some changes in, in addition to increasing the uh you know planting trees and just cooling things down creating a, a better microclimate for um you know changing for dealing with the uh, hotter drier summers that everybody's experiencing in this region and the price um, so yeah i think uh that's pretty much it. I mean, I, I'm I'm not sure. Does the, do you indicate on the the outline which which of those tests are the ones that you want everybody to do? Is that sort of in its own category? I didn't in notice. The, in the version that's going to be published, that will be emphasized. But this is pretty fresh, also uh, coming from our end this distinction. And yeah. I think it, it became clear that this is something we wanted to do um, during the yeah, event. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, if you could just put those in one beginning paragraph, these are the ones to start with, you know, that would be helpful. So we really will focus on those for sure while everybody's here, because I don't think we're going to be able to do everything during the next uh, three to four weeks. You know, we'll be waiting on some of the equipment uh, and some other things, but we want to focus on doing the ones that are the most important. And then, you know, we can add in from there over the next few months. Yeah. Yeah. We will... Uh... This is part of the plan in the new sections of the framework. Um, when do you plan yeah, to- I know it's, it's evolving, that. which is really good. I appreciate all the hard work you, you guys have done. Mick, when do you hope to have the new version finished and sent out by? I, it, Ashley, for me, it's, we, it's pretty finished um, because I'm not wanting to include the new indicators in there. And I've already done the, tweaks um, but we need to figure out some some things um, mostly about the frequency uh, the expected rate of change of some indicators I think will influence also what we want camps to be measuring every year and how or what we would like to see happening at camps every year and how, how that is done but there is some open questions there still I would like to discuss with the team on Monday and then uh, I think it can be published Okay. Based on that. <clears throat> I'm just aware that Danila and um, the VSLA team and also Richard are going to be setting off on this journey starting from next week. So it would be good for them to have it when they begin. Yeah, I think alternatively, what, what is possible um, is even after this meeting, uh, the framework with all these elements we've just discussed uh, can be shared with all data collectors and the camps who want to do their baselines or their studies in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, because regardless of, of these questions, how frequently we're going to measure uh, these things in the first year, um, so particularly this year for many camps, it's, it's very relevant to measure a wide range of indicators and uh, yeah, even if you only measure again in, in three years time, say, we know it's, it's takes quite a while to, to affect um, the compaction of our soils or change the soil organic carbon content uh, in some ecosystems, but it, it would be good. Every camp could already know how to measure that this year and, and you could receive the guidance for this uh, straight yeah. away. And then we define the other bits. Yeah, I think the frequency of how many times the tests are done over the next five years, we can think on a bit further whilst people go ahead and get started this year. Okay. I can see Igor's got his hand raised. Yeah, I have a question regarding the last change. I think we added some tests about biodiversity. Was the only addition because I don't know somehow affect uh, the costs because we submitted the budget and as they were not in the last version yeah i just a uh, curiosity how would it affect the budget or you mean for the biodiversity the nocturnal it's in principle if you have a wall um or a bed sheet it, it's not going to to uh, shift the costs at all. Maybe you have to buy a string, but it's likely that you already have this. And but otherwise- You added something. Oh, no. I 
No, maybe I didn't see in the last time that I checked it because the test about the insects was already in the framework. But I saw today there is one about uh, the fauna. Mm -hmm. And would that be done by the team in there or there will be a specialist? Because, for example, I don't know what yeah. type of plants would be growing at Camp Vissole, for example. Yeah, we so in this coming version, there will be more uh, resources and tools also suggested to help you with identifying plant species, um, but also really clear guidance on how you can you can document and look for maybe not even look for, but just document any any unexpected encounters you have um, with biodiversity and with with animal species in this case. Um, so Roland and Frank can probably also uh, say something nice about this, but you, you'll have a quadrat and you, this will be static over time. That's the idea. So in different years, you, you visit the same, um, the same area and you walk through it in a systematic way. So you don't, you don't add um, <laughs> more factors into the equation of biodiversity. And then you, you are also shown how you can document this um, you know with with the time maybe the weather conditions also uh, even temperature if you're able to record these things and then we again it's, it's an experimental thing we, we we still don't really know how we, we will be looking at this data across different camps and what kind of indices maybe we can we are able to calculate but it's but for the biodiversity tests, I would see them also as a way of simply engaging with local biodiversity and and just um, maybe quite anecdotally for now, just realizing what's what's out there and how it is improving uh, in the in the beginning stages of the camp. And yeah, we we don't really know time wise uh, how quick we can we can see, how quickly we will be able to see changes. But it's it's an evolving indicator as well and and this is what we want to also make really tailored to the specific camps so another ongoing um project is to is to work with a few camps to really figure out what's what are specialist and generalist uh, groups of species and and how we can assess the quality of the habitats being improved at the camps um, at, with them as indicators I think Igor's question was about new biodiversity tests that have been added since we sent the version of the framework that he has, but I don't think anything has been added, has it? There is, I don't really know which one you had uh, shared, Ashley, but we have, and it's also in the training videos, I demonstrate how you will do it, but the nocturnal insect sheet test, Igor, I don't know if you are talking about this one. In any case, any of the biodiversity protocols we have is there is no crazy logistics involved or costs because one involves a quadrat. You are likely to be able to build this yourself wherever you find yourself collecting data, or you will be um, putting up a light, uh, a bed sheet, which is really cool in between trees or uh, any other structure you have available and just uh, shining light on it. So. Yes, you, you will have to think of, of a light bulb and, and a way of doing this uh, for a few hours, but this is, this should not be, um, you shouldn't, I, I don't think you need to be very worried about um, any budget around this. Okay, cool. So that leads us on nicely to talking about the, um, the tests themselves. So we're thinking, there will be two ways of doing this. Either we systematically go through every test and describe it to you, and then you can ask, ask or answer questions, or we ask you, are there any tests that you are unsure about in any way? Because I'm imagining you've all read, you've all read the, the document with the tests on it. Is that correct? I sent them to all of you. Pablo, have I not sent them to you yet? Okay. Yeah, exactly. I was I was just asking how how can I access the the framework? I had a document, but it's like a how to guide with thirteen pages. Is that 
that, the, the framework. What, did you find that from the website? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So there is one right now available. Um, we have a crowdfunder on. And one that is just describing all the tests um, and doesn't yet touch on this difference between common indicators and camp specific indicators. Uh, I'll put the link here in the chat. Uh, okay, perfect. And yeah, you, I think it's a good idea. We will do this anyways. Um, after the meeting, I will share the the latest document with, with all the tests in it. And, and uh, yeah, everyone is on the same page and also all the other resources, the, the file with the budget and um, yeah, I, don't, I think other than that, we only have something to make a budget for preparing for monitoring at camps and and the frameworks from which you can select the tests. Eventually, you will also have access to different PDFs, different files for each of the indicators you want to be collecting so that it, you don't have to take a 30 pager uh, in your pocket with you when you go out to the fields. Okay. So we're talking about all of these different versions of the framework, but um, basically there was one version that was written last year, which is the one that's still on the website now. And then there's the new version that Mick has written and it has the tests themselves haven't changed since I've sent them out to you. Only the only things that really need to be added are like extra little bits and pieces of guidance and, and advice around the tests so you don't have to worry that you now have an outdated version you haven't seen the new version and you're going to collect data next week and you don't know <laughs> what the new tests are that's not um that's not happening so yeah are there any tests that anyone would like us to clarify on um that you feel a little bit unsure about because i think going through every single one step by step if you've already read them it's going to be time consuming and maybe not the best use of our time right now. And you'll have the training videos with uh, with Mick showing you how to do each one. Um, Terrell's got his hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to maybe ask for just a little clarification on the lab test. We've actually got uh, a guy coming from our regional agriculture chamber they offer that service and he's actually coming out here to get some soil samples. And um, I just was wanted to really make sure I tell him the right, you know, what we're really trying to do here correctly. And the way I understand it so far, it's we're trying to get test organic uh, matter, percentage of organic matter and carbon. Is that the main things? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll probably have access to a bunch of other things if you want but yes those for our framework that's what we would like to measure okay and the test that the lab should conduct is called loss on ignition okay i'll write that in the chat it should be in the framework too yeah. loss on and we're supposed to get individual tests from our various areas that we've chosen to monitor, right? So if like I'm gonna, me I'm gonna measure five areas, that'll be five separate tests. Yeah, yeah five separate soil samples. Um, yeah. Usually the labs even tell you how, how they want you to sample the soil. Yeah, I imagine um, you will, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, that's good, that's, that's pretty clear. Thank you, thank you. What is nice, Terrell, I don't know if this is possible, um, or affordable or whatever. But if if the tests happen at the same lab, every time you, you are going to be um, monitoring for soil carbon, because otherwise we've seen at Camp Altiplano, different labs may give even different decimals and, and this will make um, yeah the interpretation slightly yeah. more difficult, yeah. Well, it seems to me it's, it, it's that's, and we'll continue to use it. It's a service offered by the local you know, and they, they do a lot of other things that we may engage with them too, as far as consulting for farm development and all kinds of all kinds of interesting things. So I think once we establish that relationship, that'll be an ongoing long-term yeah. relationship. 
That's great. I think that's exactly what can help camps also formulate and answer some research questions will be local institutions and, and universities mm -hmm. as much as possible. It's possible to engage those. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, even if it's not about the specific indicators, because you've, you maybe only grab those when you're actually trying to do them. Um, any of the other bits on on a preparation level, um, do you think you are, um, you know how you can decide on the exact spots where you will do these tests? Uh, did the section on sampling design um, clarify some of that for you? Because this was something completely new in this, in this framework or the idea of the, of the time frame and how often you will be um, honestly, I'll have to go back and, re and review that. I mean, I've got a general idea of the areas I'd like to test just from being on the land for the last seven months and, and noticing some of the different characteristics, both in elevation and in, uh, um, you know, flora and soil compaction and dryness and things like that. Plus, looking at what we're our plan and what we intend to do in the future as far as you know, planting and, and farming. Does anyone else have any uh, questions about selecting the sampling sites? Is that clear to everyone? Can I get a yes or a no, some sort of response from you all? Hey, Ashley. <laughs> Hey Ashley, yeah, I was I was wondering. I haven't read the document because I just received the link, but I was um, um, in the website with the um, instrument uh, inside the budget and uh, the budget list. I didn't see any uh, GPS equipment or anything, and I was wondering, uh, and also a question for Mick, if the exact location in latitude and longitude for the sampling is it important or not, so that every time you take the, the sample, you take it in the same spot, or um, you are going to do it with just a, a marker, I don't know, a rod or, or something, yeah. or how is it? It's, it's a great question. Um, we recommend usually physically marking whatever you're sampling. Mm -hmm. And if we really would love every camp to also record the coordinates, that, that would change the game, I think, for future data collectors um, but yes we don't know if, if GPS if these equipments are available everywhere and we didn't want to include it in the budget list also the smartphones are it seems better and better able to uh, pin your exact location although this really depends on the kind of mm. the, the regions that you are in so yeah it's it's something that I feel also after this year we will be able to to get clarity on whether actually we should also get and maybe even the same GPS uh, equipment for every camp or not, but yeah. I think I it's a, creating a basic map, just using Google Maps where you stand at the point where you are sampling from, you drop a pin and label it. So it could be sampling, sampling site one or S1, whatever you want to call it. Um, would be really valuable and really quick and easy to do. And I think that's that's what Camp Altiplano has been doing, right? Because they collected data last year. So they have a Google map that's then shareable um, where you just put, is everyone familiar with how to create a pin on Google Maps? Yes. Yeah. So that I think if everyone is able to do that, then that would be a good thing to do, Mick. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think so. I just know it's it's not going to work so well everywhere, yeah. um, or I I don't know it's going to happen this way. But I I can imagine it doesn't work that well everywhere. I had problems with it myself on an island, uh, on dunes, trying to find the pins I had placed again um, because yeah, I mean this was some years ago. But maybe Google Google's Google Map and pin system. Has, has improved in the meantime. So we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah. 
be very interesting to hear how it goes. And obviously physical, physically marking where the spots are is definitely the, the first thing to do and should definitely be done. <laughs> Don't rely just on, uh, on technology to find yeah, where um, we are again. Yeah, maybe in the future, if the rod is still there, then with a better equipment, then you can just take it. And then I know you are, uh, we're thinking about, for example, uh, Crowder Lab and stuff like that, which uses satellite images. If the rod is still there, we can then in the future just mark it with a GPS and then and then still work with the data. But yeah, thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay, so it seems like everyone is familiar with sampling sites, seeing as no one told me that they weren't. Um, so, can I have a yes or no? Uh, yes. <laughs> On, on on the tests themselves, are there any that that we would you need us to go through? Yeah, I um, share my screen for that. Maybe. I've just maybe seen the test today. Function. Um, I don't think I got a previous email. Rihanna, yeah, yeah. So um, I think it should be fine, but I haven't had the chance to read them. This is the first time I'm seeing them. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, if that is the case, then we can have another chat about that later on. Um, has anyone read through the framework and has felt, oh, that I don't understand that? I think Igor raised his hand first and then Sylvia. Yeah, in the last conversation we had about the framework, I remember someone, I don't know if it was Sylvia, but someone from Camp Altiplano mentioned about the uh, uh, increased water retention of the soil mm -hmm. that because this test is a bit uh, like weather sensitive because they kind of recommend some conditions uh, some amount of rain for a couple of days it's kind of the recommended and then, yeah maybe but we didn't have the time to go through uh, what was their experience? So I think it would be more a question for them how they did collecting it last year and yeah, if they were able to find these conditions or how they managed to go around it. Um, yeah, I didn't do the, the water infiltration test myself. Uh, it was Michaela, one of the volunteers that were here at the time. Um, but it was more the fact that it was really time con consuming because it was slowly letting water infiltrating in the soil. And it's indeed, as you were saying, it's better be done um, after the rain. So when the soil is not completely dry, because otherwise you have a crust on the top layer and then nothing is infiltrating. Um, I don't know, for us, everything, it's a bit like we, we plan things and then the weather doesn't help and then you have to do it on another day. Um, it's just how, how it goes. You can indeed try and find the best conditions, but sometimes you just do. And actually I was going through the results earlier and there's a few results that seem really weird to me. So I don't know, maybe it's also we didn't get exactly what we what we had to get to. But the other real problem was the oven. So we just uh, solar dried the soil samples that we got out of it. But I think in the end, uh, in that sense, I think it shouldn't be a problem in terms of um, outcome. Yeah, this, this is about the water holding capacity test, just to be clear on that, right? It's not, yeah. Um, I believe we have in the framework now also a little bit on on that on the timing when when it's when it's best to do it so ideally it's after there has been some rain um, and if there is no rain this involves uh, watering the soil before before you do the tests and it's indeed we've seen also from uh, an experience in portugal it's quite time consuming and also it's not so nice because there's not that much water uh, in these ecosystems. So this is why we also um, we also include a, an alternative test for the water holding capacity test. Um, you can actually, when you're measuring 
soil compaction if you don't have the penetrometer. Uh, as you're doing the bulk density test, you can, you can measure both following the same process. So you can, you can, get, you can calculate the water holding capacity uh, of your soil or the amount of water there is ret retained in your soil because the soil sample goes in the oven for both of the tests. And you can also calculate um, the, the bulk density of your soil, which is an indicator of, of the compaction. So there, there is now some ways, and there's also a water infiltration test. Uh, we're trying to, to work out how it's best to, to monitor this over time. And yeah, it's, it's quite a standard protocol, but it, it involves a lot of watering and, and it's a bit sophisticated. We, we, we have to see how this again works out in some of the camps and in others. Uh, it, it may even not make so much sense if the, the place is always soaked or, yeah. It's, it, we wish we had more answers also and more guidance on some of these things, but it's really an uh, experimental journey for all of us in a way. And um, yeah, we hope, we hope it's now a little bit easier, at least in terms of timing. We are defining pair tests, uh, both in description of each of the indicators, we say something about when the test is ideally done. And also in the summary table in our overview, we'll have a column um, showing in what season this should be done and also differentiating between different biomes when possible. This will also help us, of course, to measure the, the same things on the more or less the same moments in different camps, which, which will be cool for uh, intercamp comparisons and aggregated data. Yeah. Sylvia, did you still have a question that you wanted to discuss? Yeah, mine was about the remote sensing for um, land surface, land cover. Um, can you tell us more about it? Because I just feel like it could be some very complex. Um, yeah, just tell yeah. me about it. Um, it's not a, a single question or a single answer one again. It's, yeah, it's something I incorporated because I think many restoration projects um, measure land cover change. So this, this is basically from above assessing how um, the canopy structure is changing or how, how the vegetation is changing and what you are actually um, measuring the kind of indices you will be using i left it's quite open in the framework uh, with the purpose that camps can find out how it can serve them because nowadays you can with google earth uh, engine and crowther lab very soon uh, restore platform you'll be able to see uh, these changes also throughout the past and how this has evolved so it's more of a prompt to to engage with that as well. And it's, um, yeah, you can, I think I can, I can share screen for those who are not looking at that test. Um, so there's a bunch of references that, that can, that link you to um, global data sets and uh, websites that are using the same data sets and you can measure, um, yeah, you can, overlay the polygons of your camps on these through these platforms quite often and, and you can see you can then distinguish there um, between the different zones of your camps and also the different uh, landscape traits and and then see how that is evolving over time and maybe it, it allows you to to understand the trends also a bit seen from space and uh, yeah it's not it's nothing that we really expect camps to be all measuring it's something it's something that is available and and it's nice because it's uh, largely open source and camps can make use of that if if they find it useful and also if they want to see how their restoration work ties in with uh, with the wider landscape and maybe how it fits into landscape restoration efforts that's the 
the main idea of um, looking at land cover change. Also, as with all the indicators that come from um, AI and, and satellite imagery, we, we are a bit on hold. We want to know how, how CAMPS can help this platform um, restore, which arises uh, yeah, alongside with the partnership with Crowther Lab, uh, between Crowther Lab and the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation. We, we would, yeah, we're eager to know how the camps can help to calibrate uh, their measurements and predictions. And so we, we don't specify so much yet how, how to use these, uh, these tools because Maybe it's a whole different protocol that we will be sharing soon, uh, based based on the information that we will be getting from Crowther Lab. And yeah, this is an evolving an evolving uh, conversation with the remote sensing indicators and also the data. I wouldn't feel to now. It, it it's not very urgent because it's it's something that you'll have. You can decide on the interval you want to be assessing, and you can. You can look in December, you can look at how it was in May or in June, of course. So it's it's not something that that has um, timing, sensitive, is sensitive to timing. And uh, hopefully what, what we are expecting actually to, to see also in the future is that through uploading the Polygon files into a platform like uh, Restore, Ecosystem restoration camps will receive an overview, uh, a few ecological insights based on uh, the data from Crowther Lab or um, the algorithms and the all sorts of equations that are being developed also through ground ground validation. So it's it's going to be, yeah, I don't know how accurate in the first years, but it, it should should become automated at some point. Ahu, I see a hand. Hello, it's my hand, by the way. Oh. Uh, um, is that and could be an opportunity to add some uh, photos that maybe we can take the photos at same angle and same altitude. That's why maybe we can add this opportunity to our uh, assessment for this method because, uh, okay, we can uh, get all these information as an image wise from the satellites or maybe somebody has a drones then they can easily take the picture of this area but uh at that time all the time well we could easily see whole things from the space as a bird's eye view that's an opportunity but at the same time maybe we can consider to take the photos with our phones or something like that in every time in every same point and same angle then we can uh, collect the whole uh, photos like a time time lapse. Maybe we can. Yeah, I think it's a it's a great idea, and it actually correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was described also in the former ver version of the framework. Um, and yeah, it's I haven't really written it out this time because of that, but I think it would be indeed great if every camp could have a picture station or some frame and people can take a picture in the same season year after year that's a really good example of a test that is really easy to do every year and and will show great great evolution yeah totally agree yeah fixed point photography is something that uh all camps all restoration projects of any kind would benefit from doing because it's a really easy visual effective wow sort of impact way of showing change i mean a, a lot of us are probably here because we've seen the before and after pictures of the list plateau and if if every camp could have its own sort of wow impact photo before and after images then it'll really help us prove that what we're doing is um is working and then the d the data can take people more in depth about exactly what they're seeing behind these amazing photo changes. Um, and it's really straightforward to do, you just pick somewhere on the landscape that has a, a point of reference. So say there's a 
there's a tree or there's a church spire or there is a mountain or something and then you you mark the point where you took the photo from with a stick in the ground or something that's not going to get eaten or knocked over by the weather and then once a year at the same time of year take a photo of the same place with that point of reference that marker in the same place in the shot so that when you look over the photos in the future you can see oh yeah that's the same place because I can see that tree is in the same position um, and there may be something to add to uh, to the list of even in the protocols so that we at least it would be really cool if every zone would have points like this so you can see the evolution say of a food forest um yeah over time good idea yeah why don't you add it in mick awesome uh igor did you have another question i, I just thought about it now could be also interesting for some Places, at least for the that can't get like, the coordinates or don't use the technology somehow, have it on Google Maps, but to have this picture of the yeah of the the place where the samples were collected in the last time. Hmm. I so I think I missed the question. My connection might be bad. I think it's mine here. Uh, yeah, but it was just an idea of the same idea for the picture being applied for the places where we collect the samples. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so many, so some some tests. Um, I I know, for instance, at Altiplano, um, soil compaction was being measured in different points, but in the same management areas uh, in different years. But for some of the tests, we are now, well, we're specifying when that's needed, that the sampling areas is static over time. So for example, for a biodiversity survey, it's likely that you'll have, you'll be watching over the same, um, I don't know, 10 by 10 meters uh, year on year. So, so that will, yeah, there will differ per indicator, but it's it's it should be clear in the description of uh, each test and also the the sampling design in general. So we are um, we can. I'm happy to show that now. I don't know uh, if there's any other questions, but there is data sheets where you'll be logging your data, and in there. Uh, you will also have a, a few columns to really define where, where you've sampled. And so when you're adding your measurements from different years, you link that with the same coordinates and the same sampling uh, locations. Mm. I just wanted to see if there were any more questions about um, any of the tests and then suggest that we have a quick break because we've been talking just for just over an hour already. and. Uh, I think when we're on Zoom, we forget that we also need to have breaks um, so that we're not zoning out. So are there any more test related questions before we have a quick, maybe 10 minute break and then come back and talk about uh, how to record the data and, and report? Uh, Danila. Uh, yeah, I have also one more question about the remote uh, sensing indicator like protein about carbon registration. Uh, sequestration and um, you wrote something about allometric equations and for those I just read shortly the document that you linked into it like you need for instance the tree height or also the crown width and how exactly can like are there apps that measure that for instance or uh, yeah I actually didn't know this was was this in the pdf we just shared with you yeah, I think the last version that okay. Ashley sent us, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So this, this is, um, well, very easy answer. I would say, don't worry about it for now as well. Because again, um, 
I was doing an internship in the forest ecology and forest management department. And so this is very applicable when you have trees capturing carbon, but also we, we, we are not going to be measuring, at least not in quantitative terms, um, people who are going to the camps to collect data will not be measuring carbon sequestration because it's a very, uh, other than the soil carbon, which is going to happen at labs mostly. Maybe we're also looking into a different method, um, but it's not ready yet to be published. It's quite complex to really be able to measure uh, with these allometric equations, the amount of carbon that we are uh, capturing. And so I don't, know, I don't think we, we are engaging uh, with that at this level, at, at this point yet, but again, Crowther Lab is also um, wanting to offer insights into the amount of biomass that is growing on the land. So you can, you can see this in the different zones. And this is through ground validation or calibration of their models. Uh, this, this will give at some point um, camps an amount of carbon that is being sequestered in living or above ground biomass. Uh, but Again, the protocol to validate this may be so, may be so specific to the platform that, yeah, maybe it doesn't make sense to now focus on such an indicator and, and develop a protocol ourselves. We don't want to be measuring it in two different ways. Um, so for now, don't, don't, don't worry too much about it. And again, it's another one that is not um, timing sensitive, carbon sequestration in the vegetation. Yeah, we're waiting for Crowther Labs to share with us their way of validating what their software is, is telling them, if that makes sense. Um, okay, any other questions about the tests? Can you give me a nod or a no or a yes? What's, what are you saying? All nods, all shakes. I'm getting confused between nodding and shaking. Okay, fab. Shall we come back in five minutes? Just have a stretch, have a drink, go to the bathroom, etc., And then um, we can talk about how to record the data, how to report it, and then what we want to do so that we can all chat um, as the data collection happens. So I'll see you back at quarter past the hour. Enjoy. See you soon.
All right, welcome back. I'm just going to make a little note of who is here so we know who has received this info. Now it's a test of my ability to remember everyone's names. Is everyone here? We're still waiting for a few people. There we go. Igor, Richard, Niraj, are you there? Yes, I'm back. Yes, yes, I'm here. Cool. Hard to tell. <laughs> um, Richard? Are you there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I have the video off because I don't have such a good connection. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to know that you're there. So the next section of this uh, conversation is to talk about reporting um, and then how we can all chat during the process if that's if that's desired. So maybe Mick, you'd like to take the floor. Sure. Uh, so first, maybe before reporting, um, maybe we can, I just like to share with you what you will have to upload the data. And now I have to choose the right thing to share. So this is um, kind of a master sheet with different indicators. And again, the, the the tabs, I believe these are called tabs and spreadsheets um, underneath will differ per camp. So you, you will be able to keep the ones that are relevant to you and remove the ones um, that you're not using. And in this overview, uh, I thought it would be, yeah, it would be nice to just keep on including here the indicators that you can choose from as we expect these to, to grow. And you can select, you can select, or just to keep a good overview, what you will be measuring uh, over time. And maybe you can even stretch this already and make a plan for year three, four, five for the whole monitoring cycle. And then, obviously, we we would like to know what what made you define the different zones of your camp or the different areas you will be monitoring. So here you can include. Um, when you start data collection, what are the different areas you'll be studying and what are the interventions that take place there or how is the ecosystem like there, depending on the criteria that were used to define those zones. And then for each of the tests, um, the decomposition rate in this case, you will identify uh, with the codes that you've used. And we, we described this in the protocol, how to create tags and unique codes for if each of the tea bags in this case. And then you can um, upload this into this data sheet as well as the coordinates. In this case, I think it will be enough to just have the coordinates of, of the plot where the tea bags are. They, they won't, you don't need the exact coordinates because you will be seeing the codes above the ground. Um, but it's just a systematic way of keeping an overview and then as we were talking about, we say we have a sample here. Uh, sorry, this should be in the coordinates. Then next year, people know exactly, OK, I, I will measure the weight of this tea bag uh, with this code uh, ABC in this location. Um, and then, then there will be another column when uh, the baseline study is conducted. You, you can. You can, in this case, be measuring the the difference in the weight or the amount of the amount of tea that was decomposed, uh, which is obviously the results that from this 
data sheets you will be able to use or, or start interpret to interpret in your reporting. Um, there is a there is a little example of how you can report on the data that you will be collecting. However, it's it's not updated with all the indicators that we have. So, uh, but we trust also, you know, reporting. It's it's going to happen that um, camps will encounter certain things and maybe even use a completely different set of indicators if they are. Uh, I don't know, taking more measurements from the lab, for example, or uh, relying more on remote sensing. And our invitation is to to write up a report and to document that. So not only in terms of numbers and, and the quantities, sometimes it's, it's this also works with some qualitative data, but also just to, to write about it and also in that way um, give a place to your to your experiences as as data collectors at the camps and also as participants in the restoration work through monitoring, um, you can then report based on on these on these uh, values that we will be putting in here. But it's not what I'm trying to say. It is don't don't look at it as a necessarily as a scientific paper in which you have uh, your introduction and and you're trying to really then define the methods and use the data that you'll be having here and, and trying to make complex statistical graphs. And it's, it really is, uh, it, it's a place where the data is, is very important on the one hand, just to be able to monitor and see how the work is progressing. And I believe the reporting side of it, the way you will be writing the, the, your findings um, as data collectors or camp managers will, can be very can be unique and, and will also uh, receive some of your creative um, inputs there, but maybe we want I don't know if what do you think of a data sheet like this? Um, it's it's something. Yeah, it's worth noting that this is not intended to be the ultimate system of storing data. So the foundation is is working to develop a data warehousing system. And will be really open sourced and also easily uh, accessible for for the wider scientific community. But in the meantime, we will be using these data sheets to just have the data in uh, in a place, and and these data sheets will be long. You you will be find you will be able to find them in your own camp specific folder with all the resources that you need for monitoring uh, this year and. Who knows this next year if the data warehousing system isn't ready, but it, it should be ready after uh, this year. So also here, I think it's yeah, it's not it's not very great use of the time uh, to to really go into the kind of things you will be putting in for each of the tests. But um, should you have any questions or any ideas around this, maybe we can uh, have a little conversation about that recording data and how, how you how you think whether you think this is going to work out well as well at the camps maybe camp managers have uh, more ideas on this we assume uh, because camps are camps involved with the ecosystem restoration camps foundation that they have access to digital devices and it shouldn't be a very great challenge to to upload the data but we're also thinking it's possible that People take um, just on hard paper, they can note the variables uh, and the different things they will be measuring on the field, say at the beginning of the day, and then at the end of the day, when they have the screens or the internet uh, back on, they can upload this into the database. So, so it, it depends on what you also have to, to collect the data. If you have an iPad, it's obviously much more convenient than, than a phone or a tablet, something that's a bit uh, larger. And it also depends on, uh, yeah, but we will have to see how it is goes in practice. If, if you don't really don't need internet for this on the tablets and these other um, Google Drive applications for your smartphones. But this is, this is for now is what we, what we thought of for uh, 
for recording the data and also uploading it into the common database of, of ecosystem restoration camps. So the idea is that you can either uh, print the, sh the spreadsheet tables and fill them in directly into the printouts. You can download the Google Drive app on your phone and then just upload the data directly into the spreadsheets on your phone. Or you can get a notebook and write and kind of draw the tables with the columns and the headings and write them in and then type up the data into the into those tables later. Um, whatever works best for you really. And we'll be sending you the links to where these spreadsheets live um, before you go. So yeah, does that all make sense? So any, are there any questions about that? Thanks for your thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have one question uh, that, hi Ashley. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question that uh, uh, can we use, uh, there are different tools or apps like Kobo Toolbox where we can have online, offline data where we can collect and and then there's an option, it can be uh, transformed into Excel sheet as well. So where there is a, a issue of network, we can uh, use Kobo Toolbox. You, it's a open source, uh, open source app, so we can check it out. Okay, that sounds like good. Here I am using for some of the survey, you can just check it out. Google Toolbox, okay, nice, I've never heard of that. That sounds it's like a Kobo toolbox. Sounds like a good good alternative when camps don't have internet but do have digital devices. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now that the discussion about how to record the data has been had. Um, part of the data collection officer role is to write a short report on your experience after you have um, found out what the results are. And the tem we've written a template for how to put the, for the headings to use when you're writing the report. But it's a sent. I mean, I can probably find it right now and show it to you. I think that would be a good idea. One second. Old one reports. I'm a bit of a fiend when it comes to making um, folders on the Google Drive, and then I can't remember where I've put things. Uh, but I found it here. Okay. So. This is how it's laid out. Um, monitoring and evaluation. If it's a baseline report, write baseline. Um, or if it's just a standard test, then you don't have to fill that in. You can just have a report. But I think it's interesting to know whether it's a baseline or not. Or maybe depending on what year you're on, you could write the, the year number there, like year one, year two, year three. The name of your of the camp you're working with and the date that you've written the report um, and then the table of contents is basically an introduction to what it is that you were doing so I have been working on the baseline study for camp XYZ um, a bit of context about the camp so explain what the camp is is doing um, in terms of restoration and who who's involved etc. So you see I've, I've got the comments here. These comments are basically descriptions of what you should write in each section. So I've made it super, super clear. And then there's the different, um, the different tests. So basically, how did the test get implemented? What, did, what exactly did you do? What were the results? 
what were the challenges that you had in doing that test and how would you suggest it's improved in the future and then there's basically a section like this for every every uh, indicator and then just a conclusion of summarize how the data collection went what the results showed what went well and what didn't go well and what could be improved um, and if you're waiting a little while on some of the test results to come in for example the results to come from the lab test you don't have to send this report immediately you can just wait until you have all the, the results before you send it um, yeah and then we'll have a really clear picture and these are these sorts of reports we can then share with the other camps and with the rest of the movement as well so that everyone has um a place where they can really understand what it is that you you discovered um so yeah when it comes to sending these round um i'll make sure that you all have uh a link to where this is saved on the Google Drive and where the, the different data um, tables that Mick just showed you where they're saved as well. Yes, are there any questions about reporting? It really doesn't have to be uh, long or in depth. You can just keep it really brief. Um, we just want we want an idea of, of what happened there because otherwise we won't know. Um, yeah. So yeah. that brings us on to how we're going to all communicate with each other when um, when we're doing the data collection. Is there is there a desire for you to all be able to chat and share your experiences? Can I get a thumbs up, thumbs down? <laughs> yeah. So what would you suggest uh, is the best way of you being able to share little comments, photos, videos? I, I think WhatsApp is great, but not everyone uses it. Um, the options I can think of are a Slack channel, a WhatsApp group, or just an email thread. Um, what are, what are everyone's thoughts? What would you prefer? So, yeah. So I would say a WhatsApp, a WhatsApp group sounds great to me. That's pretty simple. Okay, so we have two votes for email, one for WhatsApp. Maybe it'll be quicker and easier for you to all just write in the chat what you would rather. Then we can tally up the votes. All right, we've got two votes for email, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine for WhatsApp. WhatsApp seems to be winning. One, two, two votes for Slack, three votes for Slack. Is there, are there any strong feelings for any, from anyone that they really hate WhatsApp and they don't wanna use it? That seems to be the winner. There is no feeling. I have kind of brick. That's why I couldn't reach out to WhatsApp. I'm very happy with that for probably last long 10 years. Wow. That may, maybe uh, who use WhatsApp. Yeah. But of course, for uh, everybody, what it will be uh, suitable, it's okay for us. Okay, cool. Igor says that he usually doesn't have his phone with him, but you will be with Danila and Lucas and they or can hopefully share your experience for you, Igor, or you as a little unit. Um, I would be happy to create a WhatsApp group for you all. Um, and then, and I can also create an email thread. 
um, and you can decide which you would rather use. I'm sure that both will probably be checked. Um, I don't have all of your phone numbers though. So maybe you, you could just respond to the thread that I sent out with the Zoom link for this call. Oh, I've gone all robot. Hello? My voice went weird for a second. Yeah, just email me basically with your phone number and I will create the WhatsApp group. Um, I know Richard is heading off tomorrow. Very exciting. Danila and Igor and Lucas, when are you going to be arriving? Yeah, I will start tomorrow and I arrive on 1st of May. Very Ooh. excited. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Nancy and Frank, when are you starting? What's the date? June 1. June 1st, cool. I think also Fran and Roland, are you, are you doing it in June? Yeah, yeah. maybe June at some point. Okay, great. Yeah, I know yeah. that uh, Cambald's Plano is going to get started in the next week or so. Um, and Ahu, and you're also going to be starting soon? Uh, in one month, yes, we are right now in the stage of planning. Mm -hmm. uh, and also it's the high season for us now. We need to catch uh, the train before the weather gets hot. So we have our plantings and everything first ready, mm -hmm. and then we will move on it. Cool. So Next it's kind of staggered. Nice. And Michelle, also, you're going to get, you're starting the process now, aren't you, with finding the the right materials and creating a budget in Bolivia. Yeah, we are making that right now. Uh, and I think that maybe we will start with this um, in one week or maybe two. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and hello to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I just want to say that I am completely delighted with the number of you that are here and how committed you are to going to camps and collecting this information. I think that once we have it, the case for the power of the movement will be all the stronger. Um, and I'm just sitting in my house in Devon, not going anywhere. And I really wish that I could just travel to a camp and do this too. Um, you are all wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Is there anything else that anyone wants to talk about? before we close. No? Okie dokie, well, I'll see you all on the WhatsApp group then. And have a wonderful time at, at the different camps. Bye. Thank you so much, Ashley. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.